Welcome. This is the Ag Engineering Podcast, where we talk tools, tips, and techniques to improve the sustainability of your farm. I am your host, Andy Chamberlain from the University of Vermont Extension, and this podcast is supported by Northeast SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovation in sustainable agriculture. We are trying to improve the industry by chatting with farmers and getting their input on tools, tips, or techniques that have changed the way they farm for good. Many of these practices affect multiple areas of the farm. Whether it be environmentally, emotionally, physically, or financially, we share the knowledge to promote sustainable agriculture, lifestyle, and business. Thanks for having a listen. Now, let's get started. Today, this episode comes to you from Starksboro, Vermont, where we're sitting at Footprint Farm. They've been farming for seven years here, but they do have nine years farming experience. Uh, This farm grows on about two and a half acres mixed between uh, cover crops and vegetables, as well as an additional quarter acre in high tunnels. They sell to farmer's market, CSA, restaurants, as well as caterers. And off of this acreage, they're bringing in $150,000 to $170,000 in sales. Taylor and Jake Mendel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks. So if you could kick off, I gave a little frame, frame the background of your farm. Could you just describe your farm in a sentence? We're super tiny, but we do our best to grow really delicious vegetables year-round. Today, in this episode, we wanted to chat about your use of caterpillar tunnels. So for those who aren't as familiar with a caterpillar tunnel, uh, tell us a little bit about it. How does it, how does it work? So for us in Vermont, it's a three-season structure for the most part. It doesn't have much of a snow load capacity unless you are pretty diligent about going out and knocking the snow off the sides. Um, but f- basically, it's hoops set in the ground and plastic thrown over the top of those hoops and then tied down with ropes, um, basically at every, at every hoop. Um, so... They're mobile, which is a nice benefit to them. So we can move them throughout our field and have different areas of the field covered at different times. Um, We can plant things in the ground, say, in August and not have them covered and then put erect the structure over the top of it to extend the season a little bit. I think originally we kind of got into them because we got uh, late blight on our tomatoes our very first year and needed a way to keep the rain off of them basically and to do it in a cost effective manner because it was our second year so it was a good stepping stone to protected growing. yeah yeah i think we looked at it as potentially a temporary solution i think we knew we wanted to put some high tunnels in more permanent structures um, but early on, you kind of have to do, <laughs> you know, take measures that you are within your reach at that, at that moment. And we were kind of hoping for an NRCS funded high tunnel. And so while we were applying for that, we thought, what well, can we do this year to kind of get us through and be able to continue our, our production as, as planned. What's a, what's a caterpillar tunnel cost and how do you get one? Our first caterpillar tunnel we built before there were companies doing the kits. So we bought the top piece from a small high tunnel kit from Rimmel and they very nicely just sent us part of their bigger kit and we used did we reuse plastic on that first one? We bought plastic. We, we bought plastic because I don't plastic. think we had any plastic. So with the, the hoops, the rope, the plastic, the tie downs on the ends, I think it cost about $1,000 for our more heavy duty Caterpillar. We also built one out of PVC, which I'm not, I'm, it's not even worth saying how much it costs because it's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> They're not so, not a recommended so flimsy, practice. So I'm trying to remember the guy. There's a guy in New York who does a lot of caterpillar tunnels, and uh, he has a little like PDF on online, and 
I know we saw that he does a lot of the PVC ones in addition to metal ones, mm-hmm. and so we gave it a shot. It's possible that there's a way to do it well that we just hadn't fi- haven't figured out, and there are ways to manage it better than we did. But for us, it was okay, too I take susceptible. It, back. it cost about five hundred dollars. <laughs> Try at your own risk yeah. for the PVC <laughs> for, the for the PVC one. And that's is that a DIY with like PVC pipes, like a conduit with rebar yeah. to one inch, them? one inch PVC, twenty foot lengths that you just bent. Yeah, I think we used rebar. We actually ended up using, uh, I think, three quarter inch EMT or electrical metal conduit at, for the ground posts. Because the rebar bent too easily huh. under the wind pressure that the mm. the PVC sees, um, and we also I remember when we were building the first the metal one. So we got bows from Rimmel, like Taylor said, they're the, from their catamount tunnel. Um, so they, we just ordered like whatever twelve bows or something like that, um, and we we priced it out so that was able to cover three beds wide of ours and it actually ended up being cheaper than bending our own conduit so say we got you know 20 foot electrical metal conduit that would only cover two beds so per square foot it is actually cheaper to have to buy like the prefab bows and cover three beds per square foot and i'm sure that saved you a whole lot of time on install too because you're not monkeying around exactly your own hoops Yeah. yeah although then i they may have had benders out at that point, but I know Johnny sells sell some like prefab benders that are pretty easy. Right, we also to, bent one of our own. Right, a more permanent uh, prop house. There's a lot of monkeying around. A lot of monkeying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how how did you learn about caterpillar tunnels? If you can remember, I originally saw a picture of some of them on somebody's website who grows flowers. And I don't remember who it was, but I remember zooming in to try to figure out how they were tying down the ends. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't figure that part out. Um, I remember it, it being very difficult to find any information. So it would have been in 2012, 2013. And there was that mystery man in, <laughs> in New York. <laughs> yeah, that New York <laughs> farmer. <laughs> New York farmer. Right. But within yeah. just a couple of years, they yeah. were all over the internet. So... The, the resources are totally out there now. Farmer's Friend uh-huh. makes kits. If yeah, I were to do it one. again, I'd probably go through them. Yeah, that's how we found out about them. <laughs> Zooming in online. <laughs> yeah, I think a, a, lot of, zoom in. a lot of research is done that way in this day and age. So did it help your blight issue? It did. We were able to grow tomatoes. We also grew flowers in them one year. And we've done eggplant peppers so most of our solanaceous crops we've tried in caterpillar tunnels and it's really helped add some heat our season is so short here that we need additional heat to grow those longer season solanaceous crops unfortunately tomatoes get too tall so they would outgrow the caterpillars and then they would still get disease because it was so humid up at the top of the caterpillar and they get wet from brushing along the, the inside of the plastic so they died a slower death. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, we love caterpillar tunnels. <laughs> yeah, and, they, and, were, and they were good for a little bit. They were better for the shorter crops, so the uh, the peppers yep. and the eggplant. Well, it's funny you you're kind of laughing about that and making the comment how how you feel about caterpillar tunnels now. Um, if I asked you that question five years ago, you'd probably have a, a much more positive take on it. Um, but now. Or, or maybe not. Maybe they were frustrating then I too. Say, I don't know. <laughs> they, I think like everything in farming, you know, there's like a a place for it, and it it's all dependent on you know your management style or because you know it was a thousand dollars to put up, and it we got you know about half as much space as a high tunnel, which costs like twelve thousand dollars to put up but a high tunnel is much easier to manage in season. So it, it's just like, it's kind of dependent, but like. It's also oh. dependent on how much time you have to deal with it. I think right. in the beginning we weren't as busy. So 
if the plastic blew off or having to open and close them every day, it wasn't as frustrating. But later on, when we were busier, it was really frustrating to have to go out and manage the caterpillar right. tunnels. Right. Opening the sides of a caterpillar tunnel is maybe a five to ten minute deal, whereas opening the sides of a high tunnel is like 30 seconds. Yeah. And yeah. multiply that by every day 50 and it really adds up and like like you said you, you've got to be there to, to yeah. scrunch the sides up right the temperature changes so quickly in a caterpillar mm. tunnel that you really have to be around and if it's windy you have to be around to make sure that the plastic is either evenly up on both sides or all the way down to the ground on both sides because it's, it's up a little bit and the wind gets in there and catches it that whole thing is gone <laughs> They turn into kites pretty, pretty readily. Yeah. I, and always on a Sunday, seemingly when you don't have any, any employees any help. around, <laughs> help <laughs> tie it back down. Mm. Um, how how does the how do the sides stay scrunched up? And they just through the, the friction of the ropes is enough to keep them up unless the wind comes through. We've tried a lot of different things. The if if it's tight, if the plastic's tight enough, you can scrunch it up and have it stay. But sometimes with temperature changes, it gets looser or tighter. And or it'll wind. F- or wind or a little bit of rain will catch in the creases and it'll fall down. Some people mm. say that if it's raining, they just, they'll scrunch it up in the morning and then let the rain sort of close it. Um, we, we often got more puddling in that situation, which was not great but we've also tried rolling them up and really tucking them under that worked pretty well but it takes a long time and it's we've tricky to unroll yes. when you go to close them up at night too. yeah uh, we've also used clamps just those big construction clamps that you get at home depot i don't know what they're called the quick squeezy clamps yeah, yeah, squeezy, squeezy clamps, clamps. <laughs> exactly. the, the, <laughs> the little the two dollar clamps I think exactly so we will use those every, every other bow or so yeah. and clamp the plastic to the bow. Uh, we've tried different tie-down methods with the rope. So we've gone a single rope over in between the bows. We've done the crisscross scissory method, both tying down at the bow and tying down between the bows. And... The different tying methods seem to help quite a bit with holding the plastic up. We ended on having the doing the crisscross. Oh no, it's just one one rope at each in between in each between cross. bow. Yeah, because yeah. then we felt like we could kind of squeeze the plastic a little bit. It better really there. looks like a caterpillar that yeah. way. Yeah, <laughs> get the yeah. segments. I, I think we we settled on using those the squeezy clamps um, eventually because your biggest risk with a caterpillar tunnel is that one side goes down and then a wind catches that, that one side. And usually that would be the side that would go down if it got windy for, for whatever reason. Uh, so, so we felt it was worth it was safer with the clamps. Yeah. Yeah. Worth the extra 20 bucks to <laughs> make sure it actually stayed up. Um, so that was probably one of the, one of the biggest headaches is just like trying to, trying to keep track of them mm-hmm. with the weather. How long does it take to put one back together once the wind flips it open? It depends on how flipped it got. Yeah. <laughs> if the ropes are tangled, it takes much longer. Oh, gosh, anywhere from a half hour to a couple hours Yeah. to re-put it. We've gotten very fast at reassembling <laughs> with the four of us. We can really put a caterpillar back up. It takes f- about four of us probably two to three hours to set one up from scratch from nothing i think i said four of us right you did i mentioned that so four four of you four people two two hours two Two hours if we know where everything is exactly (laughs) (laughs) yeah probably we we try and give ourselves the morning to set it up which is pretty quick to set up you know three beds worth of coverage coverage but we did that and then a week later this fall it we had 50 mile an hour winds and uh, and then it we didn't reset it up after that. It, it, that was a that was a there's no hope a for this point. thing yeah. we're done yeah. yeah yeah it bent the ground posts and i think we realized we overplanted too so we didn't really need the kale that was in it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but i i think also it's 
important for us. Like, like we were saying, we, we have grown a lot of different crops in there, specifically solanaceous crops, and it did an okay job. It did better than just having them outside. Mm-hmm. But we, for the first time this year, grew eggplant and peppers in a high tunnel, which is a Gothic style 30 by 96. So a much bigger structure, much higher ceiling with peak vents. And I would say our yield maybe tripled in there. It was a whole so different I, thing. So I think we didn't even realize what the potential of these plants could be until we grew them. And it's possible there were other environmental factors at play. We, you know, we put 10, eight, 10 yards of compost in each house when we, right after building them, it was soil we hadn't planted in a while. Who knows if it was specifically the high tunnel that right, did it, right. but we were able to plant them two to three weeks earlier because the structure's bigger and holds heat better. We could have potentially harvested them later. There's more space to move around in there and do pruning and trellising as needed. I um, think that's an important point about yeah. caterpillar tunnels is they're tricky to harvest in. Because the bows go right to the edge of your outside bed. And so if you're trying to, if it's raining and you have it closed and you're trying to harvest on that outside aisle, that poor person is stuck right underneath the plastic. Um, so we, we always we always had to decide who was going to be on the outside row. <laughs> the damp and cold Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it last. <laughs> who gets to draw the short straw? Um, do, 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 do. I would say I've also seen farms do them really, really well yeah. and like them. So right, this is just, our because, experience. just because, right. Just because we don't have a, a loving relationship with them doesn't mean they're all bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've, you've had the luxury of upgrading to several uh, high tunnels, That's which, right. which is a big upgrade from a cat tunnel. So. I think if we didn't, if the NRCS, high tunnel grants weren't around, we probably would still have, I think caterpillar tunnels would still be an important part of our operation because mm-hmm. we, yeah, you just, out here, you just really need that covered space. And if we didn't have, you know, someone giving us a $12,000 structure, we probably would have to take other measures until we could get to that point. We were able to get to the point we're at now quicker because of those opportunities. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> Do they did they fund the the co- the entire cost of your high tunnels? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they paid for three of them, and including labor. including labor. So we hired somebody to put them up for us. Do you guys have anything else you want to comment on caterpillar tunnels for those who, um, either? I mean, we've covered it pretty well for those who don't know about a cat tunnel. Mm-hmm. Um, are there any other things that come to mind that you can think about that were like a big win for other experienced cat tunnel users? Like you mentioned rolling up the, the um, plastic, rolling it on the inside so the water beads off instead of creates a puddle and pulls it down. Like that's, that's a sweet little trick. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. I think it's really important to have a purlin. I don't know that, all of the models come with a purlin right away. Some of them you can add a metal purlin down for structural support. We just had a rope. and But that it's still, I'm not sure if the metal purlins would help in snow, but our plastic cats, even just the lightest snow, would take them down. And the, the metal one would last for a little while, but then you couldn't get back into it. That if there's snow or ice along the edges, you couldn't get in. So this last year, because we didn't use the caterpillar during the season, instead we used it for season extension. At the end of the year, we put it over a bed of kale, and we added a door at the at one end of it. So instead of doing the ponytail down, I don't know what other people call it. We call it a ponytail on either end. But we did a ponytail on one end, and then on the end facing our road, we built a frame and a door into it so that we could get in even if it was snowy. And that's something we got from Paul and Sandy Arnold. They still use some, some good, good caterp- caterpillar use mm-hmm. on their farm. I would say 
one of the mistakes that we m- made with them that could easily be remedied would be we, I, we got our, bought our plastic mm-hmm. a little bit too short, so it barely touched the ground on either side, and that causes a lot of problems. If any wind comes and like shifts the plastic at all, one side can't get down to the ground. So I would leave at least maybe three or four feet on each end. So that way you can really make sure. This is So going up and over. Up and over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Those purlins you mentioned about, is that support going on the bow from one side of the bow to the other, or is that connecting multiple bows? So if I would do it, the the purlin's going to go at the apex of the bow, at the very top, and it's going from bow to bow. And then I would also put a diagonal one from each end bow. So starting up at about shoulder height on the end bow and then going down to meet at the base of the second bow to keep that end bow from going in and out. And I would use, we've tried, the, the Arnold's use PVC, I believe, for mm-hmm. that, that diagonal piece. That bent for us, so we this year used EMT for that piece, which worked much better until the 50 mile per hour winds came. And then there was, we had bigger issues. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There's not much hope for plastic and hoops. Those two structural pieces, I think it would be really helpful. Do you think you, you mentioned you'd kind of built a, built an end wall for it. Mm -hmm. Um, It sounds like that was uh, uh, beneficial and, worth the extra time that it took to, to do that probably mm-hmm. just for access getting in and out like you said mm-hmm. uh, especially if there's any snow on the ground um do you think the end wall causes more troubles in the wind than the just the ponytail tied down i don't think that it makes a difference the the difference that it makes is that with the ponytail you have a force pulling lengthwise on the structure so it helps keep the bows up and down Mm. but if you just have that door and the plastic is so tight pulling away from the door that there's a tendency for the the end bow that has the door in it to pull back towards the rest of the structure which is why you need those diagonal pieces to keep that end bow up gotcha and i think having that metal purlin from the end bow into the first into the second bow would really help keep that up as well we tried putting some T-posts in the ground with ropes down to them to keep that end bow with the door in it. <laughs> Pulled out. <laughs> vertical. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there's just there's so much tension on the plastic that there's a lot of pressure Especially if there's any back. snow load on it. Especially if there's any snow that makes it, makes it more. Taylor and Jake, thank you for uh, being part of this episode. And uh, if farmers want to learn more about you and your farm, how's the best way they can get hold of you? There is a contact page on our website, www.footprintfarmvt.com. We're also on Instagram. We do a lot of that. That's how I communicate with the outside world. I will provide some links to where you can get some uh, caterpillar tunnels and information in the show notes of this podcast. Uh, I will also list the um, social media links to Footprint Farm. So thank you guys for joining this episode. And with that, we'll catch you on the next one and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I hope you go ahead and subscribe, share this with a friend, or leave us a comment. And if you want more information, check out the show notes on our website at agengpodcast.com. That's A-G-E-N-G-P-O-D-C-A-S-T dot com. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great day. The proceeding has been a production of University of Vermont Extension. For more information on Extension, log on to www.uvm.edu slash extension.